welcome to CDR. Um, who's there for the first time? I know my man from Portsmouth. Where is he? Big up this guy, man. He's come all the way from Portsmouth, you know. That's big. That's big. We'll see him again next month, won't we? We won't pay your fare, man, but it's all good. Um, I'm sure we can get you a discount. Um, it's cool. So, thank you for coming. This is CDR, um, the night of ideas and tracks in the making. My name's Tony. Um, I'm here with the amazing Geica. Give it up, people. Hello, good evening. And um, for the next kind of 45 minutes or so, we're going to, yeah, talk through um, a couple of tracks that he's um, going to share with us um, and some kind of insight into his music production and generally all things Geica. How you doing, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I've been in the studio all night, so excuse me if I'm a little bit spaced out, but yeah, I didn't really sleep. We can all relate to that. <laughs> you know, yeah. Lots of nights ch tuning kick drums and reverb tails. We all know all about that until <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So before we kick into the music side of things, just want to know a bit about you, you know, and, and essentially, you know, what was it like growing up, Geica? You know, you're a South London boy, right? Yeah, I grew up down the road. Yeah. My mum still lives down the road. Um, what was it like growing up? Um, I tell the two cities, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think I always lived around South London, always lived around Brixton or Streatham. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I lived in pre-gentrified Brixton. Yes. But then I travelled out to go to school, mm -hmm. past Sutton, and uh, I sort of went in from the uh, sort of a local hood area, and then travelled to this super selective school, um, and I, it was from white to black every day. Mm -hmm. um, it was a kind of a weird thing. Like we didn't grow up with no money, so there was a huge premium on on education being the kind of route out of you know what my parents worried would be in store mm -hmm. um so was there a decision for you to go to a school in Sutton essentially yeah well yeah. I went to yeah I went to Crown Lane mm. uh, primary school and then basically all the black boys that they had they were going to send us to kind of prove whatever, pro whatever, business yeah. whatever yeah. sink place there was and my parents were just like look we can't we can't afford the private education so why don't you sit this exam and I hope that I would get in and I did and so they were it was a weird thing because they were quite vehemently against that kind of thing they were quite political people and so it it meant that it was just a real steep jump because it, it, it wasn't something that I was prepared for or that my parents actually really engaged in beyond sending us there yeah, yeah, yeah. so I kind of always had to I'd never felt like I fit in, so I decided very early that there's no point trying to fit in. Okay. So I'd just be at all points, wherever I was, I would be me. Um, and it, I guess that's kind of set me up creatively in like, I, I guess deciding or, or, or feeds the, the decision making process is like, do I believe in this? Is this a true representation of like what's inside my head? So I guess maybe that hybridity thing was just having influence from lots of stuff. Always been fascinated by a subculture, like what the people around me was doing, whether that be grand music or garage music or jungle, whether that be everyone being into Oasis and Nirvana. Yeah. Um, it was it was always like a sponge, you know? Um, was it kind of like Oasis in Sutton, you know, grime in Brixton kind of vibe in terms of your, uh, you know? Uh, no, nah, I'd say, Brixton was always a melting pot. I think it was more like, it was more like we were carrying that music mm -hmm. to, to, to school, to there. And for me, it was like, I don't know, it wasn't secondhand, like, the, you know, so it's on a crew on the TV and they live next to me, you know? Yeah. So it was like very, I mean, we, start, we started putting on raves when we were young because they wouldn't let us into clubs, you know? And so, and we knew all the people on Pirate Radio because those, we lived in the area. So it was suddenly like, okay, this is a way to make money because we kind of stand at this gateway. Um, and this is a way to kind of stop people from giving you shit, basically. Whether it's some kids at school that wanted to talk shit or whether it's a kids and a man that wants to talk shit. It's like when you're the person that's hosting the rave, then it's like, okay, you, you become this kind of social grease. And I guess, that started my fascination with like the power of music to 
kind of like break down kind of what I see as false barriers. Mm -hmm. So from school to obviously getting into music and yeah. putting on parties, at one point did you say, you know what, this music thing is going to go beyond just putting on parties to actually, you know, contributing to, and making my own stuff? Yeah, like I, I started from putting on raves and I, I started getting into graphic design and design work because I wanted to make the, the flyers and then just to make the art around this kind of clubland subculture and then I went up north went to university and I, I, I carried on doing this thing to quite a high level because I wanted to, you know I, I needed to pay my way through mm -hmm. and then at some point I had kind of a pretty successful career doing that and as in, as in designing flyers for people well it, it flyers turned into doing music videos turned into okay. like actually yeah. being an artist mm -hmm. um, and I had a friend and he's he, he he had a band and he asked me to be in it because I don't know, he liked my jacket or whatever. <laughs> but I also was kind of had an encyclopedic understanding of music because I'd always been into it. Mm. And I didn't really know that I had a, a talent for it, but I guess he identified it. And then when I went in the studio and it just just came very naturally, mm. like more naturally than the visual stuff that I would make a living from. Mm -hmm. So it just, I don't know, it just, just kind of came out of me. And then from that point, it was like, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a go because I'm, I'm, I find it quite easy and people seem to like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, Can you remember the first thing that you were, or one of the early things that you were happy with that you kind of put out? The first thing I was happy that I put out Oh man, um, yeah, we done a, we we did like a some kind of bootleg tune of a of like a Zinc record, okay. and then it was like one of the first things I ever did, and then DJ Target started playing it on the radio, mm -hmm. so it was from the jump people were interested, um, and then not not long after that, I remember the first show that I played, like in front of anybody we were supporting the Wu-Tang Clan. Okay. So I walked on the stage. Yeah, you were, yeah? yeah just mm. to, after in Manchester, I walked on stage, you know, and I had like my lyrics like on bits of paper and I walked out first time to like this big crowd at Academy One thinking that I'm going to be nervous, this is going to be, and I had this moment of like, nah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it just, like peace came over me. And so I kind of felt like, all right, like I get it now. You know what I mean? Okay. So you cut your teeth with Wu-Tang then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good much. place to start for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think I've had like a wild adventure in music so far and I'm really, I'm really happy about that. And I'm really, you know, it's, it's been amazing really. I think I'm lucky that I, because I built up through Clubland, through the underground, through real stuff, it meant that actually, I say that's the first show, that's the first show, you know, outside of the club that we ran, yeah. but actually was there performing every night, every, every, every week for years and years and years and years. I had a chance to develop with my friends and with, a, you know, like an actual real development, not just like, oh, like this is a viral hit. And now suddenly you're on stage at wireless and things are going wrong. It didn't. <laughs> You know, it didn't work. It didn't. It didn't happen like that for me. So, um, it, it was more just. I feel like I was at the end of the kind of old school mm. way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll talk a little bit about drift in a minute. But yeah. it, on the road to drift, you've obviously yeah. had a whole bunch of EPs and mixtapes. Yeah. Um, in your on your journey to drift, can you kind of talk us through? Um, I guess the kind of cre creative decisions in terms of the style of music that you're focusing on, this kind of hybrid of grime and dance, all that you're talking about, you know, how have you navigated, you know, making those EPs and mixtapes, you know? Yeah, I think all the work I've ever made is kind of, I think of it, it's kind of concept work. I don't necessarily think of the concept before I start it, but there's a point in which I'm making something and I kind of view it almost like a, like a sculpture. It's start to take shape and I start to see what it is. And it's drawn from the, very many influences in my life, like whatever the internal music is and how it starts to 
express itself to me. And then I think, okay, this is this is the flavor. I always describe it like this, like, you know, I ask people, what's the flavor of Coca-Cola? I'm always trying to make music that you can't, it's its own thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't really, you can see there's notes of things or there's references or there's influences, should I say, but it's kind of a smooth mix that becomes its own, it, it creates its own identity. And at some point in the Genesis of a project, that happens. Mm-hmm. And so I think with Drift, it was like, I kind of wanted to make a record that really um, spoke to my younger self, spoke to kind of making tapes and putting my headphones on and like just going about my business, whether that's riding my bike, whether that's traveling, whether that's going surfing, whether that's whatever it was I was doing, I always had these kind of really eclectic yeah. mixtapes. And um, I wanted to make something that kind of felt like that. And I thought the best way to do that would be to do it organically. So I kind of created a studio, I had a pop-up gallery, I had another studio, I created all of this art space to just make things for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. And then just... When you say make things, that's cr- multidisciplinary, right? A sound, yeah. audio, video, the whole sound, lot. Sound, audio, yeah. video, to yeah. just create yeah. like totally freely and then, and see what happens as opposed to sitting down in, in this prescribed way and saying, all right, I'm gonna make this album that needs to, needs to do this or it needs to be this or it needs to be that. Because I think you can't, I don't know, that's kind of the tail wagging the dog for me. So once we started doing that, it, that kind of the sound of it, I, I, I can't really describe it. I guess part progressive rock, part ambient, part rap. I don't know. Um, really started to. I'm like, this is this is what I'm doing. It's, this this makes sense to me when I listen yeah. to it as a whole. But it's like I think. I mean, would you agree that it's a kind of I won't say a, a marked departure. I mean, obviously yeah. the 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 combination of elements is definitely Geica, but yeah. in terms of the sonic direction, it's quite a departure from your previous outputs, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, if you actually, if you actually listen to those albums, like there's, those songs are there. Yeah. there there's there's the, the notes of what's to come. So I could have gone various different directions. I kind of feel like whenever you make a piece of music, it, it leads you to a fork in the road. On, as you go into the next piece of music. And so, you know, after doing basic volume, which for me was in many ways about my dad who was, who was dying at the time, mm. I wanted to make this kind of spiritual Jamaican record. Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, I felt like I wanted to draw a line onto that. I've, yeah. It's called basic volume, it's just, one, it was named after you know his company, his business, mm-hmm. and the story of his life. And two, it it also. I feel I feel like I achieved what I wanted to achieve with that sound in in terms of progression in dance or music, yep. and making that a thing. And I think that afterwards, I wanted to explore like other parts of my psyche, other parts of my creativity that were actually sort of present in, you know, yeah. in within those records. Oh, it's just, okay, we'll go down this way. And, you know, after Drift, it's like, okay, well, go one way, you know, I've made a rap record and I've also made a whole other rock thing. Mm-hmm. So I, it comes from just being somebody that wants to like always do something new. And I love making music. That's the thing for me. For me, making music is therapeutic. It's not, I'm not doing it for any other reason that it makes me feel good. So I'm just gonna go where my heart takes me. So how did your start then? How did it start? Um, I can tell you. Um, so I you, had, m- you had this space that uh, had, yeah. you know. Where did it start? It started yeah. with me wanting to, um, I was working a lot of soundtracks and me thinking, I like how pretty this ambient textual, like synthy thing that I, that I, you know, I'm a synth nerd basically. W- how can I incorporate that into actually structured mm-hmm. songs? Um, 
and a lot of the time I'm driven by like technical considerations. And then I started thinking, oh, wouldn't this be great if we had like real drums and real instruments? So because all the people, that's it. Because I had so many people around with like players, mm -hmm. it's just it's this communal thing of like, okay, well, I started buying instruments and then pick, people come, people come and pick them up and it just became yeah. like that. And 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 then you know at some point I'm listening to it, I'm like, okay, this is feels like a band project. It feels like something that's shaped that way because it it, it has involved a kind of communal feeling mm -hmm. um and it, it and so what i did was just recorded loads and loads and loads of sessions and just took bits mm -hmm. and like kind of put it together yeah. as you would be doing the score mm -hmm. so I'd, i would listen to the whole thing yeah. at once over and over and over again it's designed to be listened to at once like you put your headphones and you and, and you dive in i think it probably started with me struggling with music being made for streaming music being short yeah. music being like a confined, drive, confined, confined and, yeah. and like simplistic, yeah. And I wanted to just do something that was really not that, so it was a kind of maybe a reaction to sort of you know, I think I got signed because they thought I was gonna be some kind of dance hall heartthrob, and obviously, <laughs> I'm not a dance hall, but you are a dance hall, you're a dance <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it was a reaction to that. And I was like, you know what, hold this indie record, you know what I mean? <laughs> um. Cool. So I guess, like a lot of artists, you don't want to be pigeonholed, right? So you just want to, you know, it's all about your artistic output, right? D should dictate the narrative, not the other way around, you know? Yeah, or it's more, it's not that I don't want to be, I just don't feel that I am. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care enough about being popular mm -hmm. to make a sort of consistent attempt at, like, building a fan base. Like, that doesn't really matter to me. Like, what matters is that like, I enjoy making the music and that I think that is good and you know I'm really grateful for all the people that have, you know that have enjoyed the music that I've made and so on but I just don't think that you can be like stuck in in the, trying to repeat what you've already done yeah. I just I don't see it doesn't appeal to me I hear that so should we have a listen to the track from Drift yeah and then talk it through. Cool. So these are the stems, yeah? So we will just yeah. talk through the stems. That's these fine. are the yeah. These are the live stems. Yeah. So I'm gonna just play the song. The song is called First Month's Misfits. <laughs> When 
so yeah, the, so those, what you can see is the actual, the stems from a live show. Um, so when we, as I was kind of envisioning it, because I had done quite a lot of sort of spatial sound installations, I kind of from the beginning imagined it as something that would be deployed in that way. And so actually you know, the last show we did was with this big kind of spatialized like DMB system and stuff like that. And this is from the session. So it's kind of the mix is a little all over the place, but that's all right. I and mean, mix aside is, you know, that's fine. Um, before we talk about the individual elements, yeah. Um, just want to circle back on the compositional aspect of yeah. this, right? So, was this captured like a band, or was it jam? Well, yeah. So, how was how was the composition? So it's like a, it's a mix. Yeah. It's so some bits were mm. like um, so some like some of the synth and the drum parts were, and then some bits were added afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's just a mix. I think we started off kind of just jamming around. It, it started from actually, I'd ask the narrator. Amber, the singer, she to come to the studio to sing on another song, mm -hmm. and she just started. She picked up a bass guitar and started just like messing about with it. And I was like, "Okay, let me just record this." The, the, the main riff, the, yeah. the main riff. Yeah. Will, 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 will. yeah, you know, and that's what I mean. It's like I quite like to go with what's happening in the moment, and then we we kind of I kind of built a track out around it, and then. And then we recorded some vocals, and then I took that track and then added some other parts when we were just mm -hmm. tracking the drums. And it's so it's, it's always a mix, and just like I'll, I'll I'll listen to music that's unfinished over and over, and kind of it's like write notes and think about it, and then change things and so on. Um, but I I like to catch things, yep. especially catch with this moment. album, which is yeah. about catching a moment, catching a moment in time. Um, and I think that song like quite. Um, of all, it's quite raw because I, it, to me, it's the sound of like being like locked in that studio sure. in the pand <laughs> in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to just record a moment in time. That's what Drift is really all, all, all about, and, and not being so sort of um, studied. Yep. It was the opposite, even the, the artwork and just how we present the whole thing. I wanted this to be true music mm -hmm. and not this kind of product that is sort of like decided by like focus group or whatever. Sure thing. So maybe we should start, maybe isolate the, the, the bass to start think, start yeah. off because it, yeah, it sounds, sounds like chorusy to me. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh no, wait. Yeah, right. there's two, yeah, there's that, yeah. Expensive bass or anything like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> box standard, kind of cheapo bass, and yeah, I just kind of added a bit of chorus, a bit of flange. I use I'm pretty much all hardware producer, yeah. so I've got a H entire H9000 effects unit, yeah. which I kind of after the fact pass everything through to add the reverbs and just general like treatment and. I'd use, I'd, in terms of EQ, I'd use a combination of um, Fab Filter, yep. um, standard. standard, but then I also do that at the same time as I'm doing the pass through. Gotcha. Yeah. Into so processing it, processing in real time as you as you're hearing yeah, it. Yeah, as I'm yeah. hearing it. Into like I've got a um, seven four seven or seven three seven, um, like a channel strip, um, and just. I kind of like to set up these kind of hardware chains and then like knob fiddle yeah. as at the same time as I'm kind of affecting whatever I'm affecting. On the Is that while you're printing it down? You're kind of fiddling on yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll record it and then I'll reprint it, but I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. kind of yeah. change it. And then sometimes, and then often I'll have to 
go and use isotope stuff to like get cable pisses and stuff like that. I, I want a bit of saturation, but sometimes it can be too much because I'm not like I don't have time gold cables and all that. Yeah, sure. um, I think um, the other thing is I've got a uh, a kind of EQ that which is kind of an inductive EQ which it's like it's a 70s thing okay. and it saturates as you as you EQ so it colors it's, it's, like, it's, and texture. it's deliberately yeah. non-transparent and it just gives you that kind of like old school texture nice. so like this whole drift sounds so retro because all the gear is literally from that time um, amazing Should we, so you've got along with this bass which yeah. is more like a mid you've got like a sub as well yeah. right which i assume is just processed infinite right Yeah, and um, it was that was made with synth. Yeah. So I think I've got um, I use I've got Odyssey, an Arp Odyssey yeah. from the seventies. It's a mono synth, um, and it's just really warm. Yeah. And it's a little bit temperamental. It kind of does what it wants, but it's you know I I, I wanted to really get away from how digital some of my past releases had sounded. But then again, you know, in my head they were digital, but then somebody once said to me, you guy you're an analog man in a digital world. Because <laughs> yeah. I was lucky enough to, um, I was lucky enough to kind of be mentored by somebody who himself had um, been mentored by Mushroom okay. from mm-hmm. Matthew Tech. Yeah. So I kind of pretty early on got hands on a lot of hardware. Yeah. And I, I kind of gone to the studio as a, as a rapper, and this guy had all this stuff, and I was like, look, I want to learn how to use all these things, mm-hmm. and so I I learned that way. So I'm I'm not the best with, the, I, do, I couldn't tell you the latest plugins or or whatever, but I'm a nerd for like, yeah, old school the, the tactile stuff. Yeah. yeah. So um, the so would, is, was the bass as in the t- the um art b- mm. um bass was that played manually? Just yeah. like, yeah, okay, cool. So again, just captured, yeah, jammed along and processed. Just compression, I guess, or? I can't remember, but yeah, yeah probably compression yeah. and a bit of um, a bit of EQ. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. Um, played in, yeah, because that synth doesn't have MIDI. It's yeah. pre-MIDI. Mm-hmm. So it's like, there's no, <laughs> there's no real way of, I mean, there is, but it's, I'd, I'd rather not. You could just, you just play it and you've got a, You've got to tune it. It's not. It's not got fixed pitch. Yep. So if anything, they might have. I might have auto tuned it. In fact, that's something yeah. I'll do. Is get a, a kind of wild instrument that has no control, and then use tame the beast, modern <laughs> stuff to tame it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Hear you. And again, I guess once you've captured it as a recording, you can obviously chop it and get it in time if you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Timing is a bit relaxed. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, it, I think it definitely is. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So let's go to the drums from there because I, I really like the sound of the drums. Yeah. There's definitely some kind of yeah vintage wonder happening with the drums. Yeah, yeah it's quite interesting. So if you um so the the EQ I've, I've run it through the um the EQ as I said for the MG so but they, they were actually recorded through um they were actually recorded through a, like a big old Neve um, and then processed there as well. So yeah, it's, um, Super Symmetry in Tottenham, this guy has this giant like old school Neve desk. I think he got an advance and just bought a desk. <laughs> and, <laughs> as you do. Yeah, I think, I think Nap's the owner studio now, but I don't know. But anyway, check it out, it's great. And yeah. yeah, we recorded it through there and like mixed it with the stressors and like analog hardware. I was gonna say, was it recorded to tape at all? Uh, so I use a thing. I think it's a secret weapon. It's called Mix Analog. I don't know if anyone else uses it. Tell us about Mix Analog. I am a massive evangelist for these guys. They're in Germany and they've just got a room in an office somewhere and it's full of gear and they've somehow worked out how to 
you can control it via the internet. Gotcha, yeah. So you send them the track, you send the track, they upload it, and he runs it through the actual gear, and it's pretty much real time, and it feels like real time, and and you can manipulate it. You buy blocks of time; it's not crazy expensive, and on a lot of this album, I use a tape machine. So this was definitely yeah. about it definitely ago. sounds it. No, it sounds great. It sounds really yeah. really cool. So, I, I so wanted to get those like Michael Jackson vibes, you know. <laughs> It sounds more ESG to me, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, mm. my whole pop radar is really <laughs> skewed, <laughs> skewed, but um, yeah, in my head, I w- it was just, I wanted like 80s yeah. sounded drums, but not, I always find that when you like the boxy setting yeah. on your software always just makes your drums spin. Mm. So the only way is to actually just do it with that equipment. Absolutely. And did you play the drums or? No, I didn't. Yeah, play. okay. But, uh, Anton, I don't know if the, um, he goes by the producer name Samantha. Okay. Um, super talented musician. Came in and played the drums. What is, it's a funny story. The drums actually, the demo drums that I put in were actually much sort of more like ESG, like they were straighter. Yeah, yeah. And he is a gospel drummer. Okay, yeah. And he was like, I can't, I can't play <laughs> these drums. He was like, I'm too black for that. And he, <laughs> and then Amber was like mad because she was like, "Oh, it's not the song, not the same." And I, I was like, "I kind of like it." And yeah, so we sure. ended up having this like swap. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, what next? Um, so may go through the synth sounds and the textures. Yeah. So just one, just one thing about the drums as well. Just before yeah. we go to the synths, so. Um, Obviously, you've got stereo track there, but yeah. when you actually recorded them, did you record them as separate stems and then mix it down? Yeah, what was the process to yeah. actually get it to a stereo mix? Yeah, we recorded it separately yeah. and then just mix it and then and then I'll, I'll do various layered bounces to get various layered bounces to get to, mm-hmm. to a certain thing. Mm-hmm. I've got, I've got an, I've got an Integra Seven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I use quite a lot of the like synthy. Is that Roland? Roland thing, Integra yeah. Seven. Yeah. I use yeah. quite a lot mm-hmm. of the synthy sample like that are on there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I've also got like some pretty weird like um, wave tabley kind of nineties mm-hmm. kind of proggy things and um i can't i can't remember exactly what it was but i think it was a mixture of stuff on the integra and stuff from um those 90 cents and i ran that through the h9000 okay and then layered it up to get that kind of depth to, and spatialized yeah, yeah, yeah. um and then that was it i also at the time i was working on a on a installation like a space installation and I actually ran the synth through the whole installation and recorded it on a okay. on a like a on a zoom, mm-hmm. and then layered that in to to, to also kind of create some three <laughs> Dness to it, yeah. and then again bounced it all to tape and yeah. kind of like roughed it up a bit. Um, and in terms, I guess the composition, I guess you just it feels like it was just just playing some notes that sounded nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't don't write music yeah. or anything like that. Um, and I think, it, I think with that actually, I probably sometimes I'll use like I'll take MIDI from a drum pattern mm-hmm. or some kind of like an arpeggiator or, or, or something like that, and then run it through, record it back, and then chop up the bits, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, um, or I'll just play and just find the bits that 
it sound good and then use them. Yeah. So a lot of it is about just like, I guess, capturing and being excited about what you're listening to, right? Yeah. And then bringing it together. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely. know. No, cool. It, it was definitely informed by the fact I was making lots of score music. Yeah. So it, it's like, I'm, I was just trying to like, I, sometimes I put up a visual or I would think like hold an image in my mind and try and like play to that mm -hmm. as opposed to um, thinking, okay, this needs, this needs to happen here and this needs to happen yeah. here. And this is, you know, it was just quite free form, but then it meant that afterwards there was a lots of editing to be like, oh, this needs to just move just to here. This needs to be just so as you would do with a score. So yeah. it was sort of like building it like that. But it's great though, because there's a, particularly in the composition process, there's a freedom, right? Cause yeah. you know, you can edit later. There's, you can just, T whatever your wherever you feel like going with the recording you can because you know you can make sense of it or give it some structure later right so there's rather than that. the other way around which is a tradition a lot of people do that making music in sections while they're going whereas this is like the opposite right yeah yeah mm -hmm. definitely I, I always like to leave the studio with something to listen to especially in this project it was like I would, i'd be listening to it mm -hmm. and then making voice notes or writing down what i thought about it and all those words um so I always wanted to leave the studio with something. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it, I would kind of always get to the end. It was never that thing of like, make a section and it's two minutes long. And now, and now we need to force, or what's the, what's the outro gonna be? Or what's the intro gonna be? And all the rest of it. it was more like, okay, we've got this much. If anything, it's like trying to make it shorter. Yeah, absolutely. Just edit, 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 edit. Yeah. So let's look at the vocals now. Uh, maybe Amber's first before we go to yours. Yeah. yeah. So because this is a live, um, these are just backing vocals, yeah, but sure. you can hear them. It's interesting though, because whoops, let's go to here. In the morning, we killed that guy. Fucked it all. Fucked it all. Can I park in ties your brain? So again, these were the ones captured initially, then processed afterwards. Right? Yeah, yeah. So mm. we, we found that um, I had a, like a. We recorded it often. I record using a SM58 just in a room, mm -hmm. uh, especially on this record, and and I kind of like how rough the vocals are. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we kind of I kind of blended that. I, I got to come back and go over on like a, a much more controlled situation, but. I didn't, it, it kind of lost the charm. Mm -hmm. So I just blended them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then it, it was, with this thing, it was always about trying to keep the live sound, mm -hmm. but like tame it so it wasn't just hiss and it's like a mess, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, but I, I wanted it to sound as it was live. It wasn't, you know, we, we were literally jamming and I wanted to kind of get that that energy because she's kind of wrote the, wrote the lyrics on the spot. Mm -hmm. And I want it to feel like that. So with the effects that you've got there, mm. it feels like, yeah, obviously there's some reverb on there and some kind of, I guess, compression. Mm. Um, yeah, what else is it? It's like a flanger or a phaser or yeah, something so on there as well. There's, I use flangers, choruses. I just kind of like, I've always used phase as a kind of creative tool. Mm -hmm. I think it's funny that, that it's trendy now, but, um, you know, when I came out and I was like, these vocals are mental. I just, for me, I always like the sound of like slightly phasey. It gives it a kind of, it's artificial, but like not in a robotic way. Yeah, not in an auto-tune way. That's in yeah. deliberate auto-tune way, yeah. And in, in, in a way, I, I kind of, because I do use tuners on my voice, mm -hmm. I kind of used the the analogness of it and the, 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 the kind of phasey effects to kind of, take out some of the harshness mm -hmm. that sometimes people associate with with water tune um and so it, I, I guess from doing that i've developed a habit of like just like i like an in, interesting vocal as opposed to a, a per, always a perfect vocal sometimes there's a time for like a really really controlled thing but sometimes it's just it's it is what that. it is it just sounds is. cool yeah, yeah. Yeah, so with that in mind, yeah, let's let's have a listen to yours in con. Yeah. 
of life We took our chances Hold the phones And do your dances Lazy bastards Lazy bastards Don't let them get you down Guard the gates if you must Outside the stadium if you trust No justice if you're soft That's what I got for you Cool So before we go into the kind of technical detail Yeah, yeah talk us through your Yeah, what's your Yeah, how did you get to that vocal? In terms of the lyrics and performance, yeah, you know, we were we were in the room together, and we, she had just w laid down a part, and Amber, I like, had written a song about misfits. A song was about the TV show mm -hmm. Misfits, and I, I kind of, kind of took a, a kind of lyrical leap from that, in so much as you know, I'd never actually watched the show, but it's more like what it, you know what it means to, to to be a misfit or to not quite you know fit into um for me parts of the music industry mm. and so that verse ends up becoming a, a commentary on that right um so it, it was triggering for you in in you know as in a literal misfit rather than you know something. yeah yeah so, yeah and then I, I think she got it and it, it's, it's the whole song becomes kind of allegorical right and i think um it's just we, we you know she just said it reminded her the the, the the riff reminded her of like that show and then that kind of led me to kind of start structuring it you know like what my interpretation of yeah. that was so it's it's this thing of like when you actually make music in the room i, I really don't like remote collaboration like via the internet i don't i'm kind of notorious for just not doing phone-ins because I just I think it's there's a magic that happens when you're actually both in the same place Absolutely. and I I need that mm. um, and um, that's why I really like this song because it's it's sort of it's epitomizes what I was trying to do with that record which was to kind of get away from music making as this kind of corporate endeavor based on p um, potential right where people say right if you go in the studio with this person you go in the studio with this person and your manager talks to the, their manager and d everyone everyone's worked out what's going to happen yeah. as opposed to just actually like jamming it together and let and letting it be and that that's what that song was as 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 sort of live and jammy and weird as it is it's just somebody who's actually my friend in the studio mm -hmm. making a song so i guess you're more concerned about being in the moment then you are, whether there's, in inverted commas, mistakes, you know, delivery that isn't quite on point, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not yeah. always. Sometimes I'm very precise. It's like, yeah. as a producer, I'm, I'm quite, like, particular about things. Mm. But I also think that there's a charm in letting things ride as they are. Absolutely. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm not a person that likes film as opposed to digital. Um, I like stuff that's just not always perfect, but has intention. And character and, as and well. Ca yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. character, because yeah. I think like, I don't know, maybe it comes from being a DJ, all, all my favorite records, like you can't mix them because <laughs> the drums just uh, yeah. <laughs> just move, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that sort of like very, that like, gritty way where we kind of make music at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, because I learned on equipment and like playing and stuff, yeah, it, that's just never really been for me. But I think this was the first time that I really kind of used like lots of other instruments as opposed to just okay, I've got some drums here and now yeah. I've got some. I'm playing in the Sims and I'm, I'm da -da -da. this was like okay, I'm adding in other people's yeah, other energies as well, as well. Yeah. other yeah. energies, mm. and then trying to like tame it all together. Yeah. So with this, um, you know, you recorded vocal in a particular way. Yeah. Um, was the processing done afterwards or as part of the recording process? So did you, mm. you know, just, just record, you know, raw and then process afterwards or was it, was there a signal chain recorded? It's a, it's a bit of both. So yeah. I always have some, some chain going in. Mm -hmm. um, I just, 
like people would be like, where are the dry vocals? I'm like, there are no dry vocals. <laughs> because I just, I, I just, I work really quickly. Yeah. So my thing is like, you make a decision mm-hmm. and that's it, you got to live with it as opposed to like, uh, now I'm just, yeah. you know, th- there's, there's, to me, there's got to be a limit. Um, otherwise you can, I will get stuck tinkering. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather just, okay, well, my vocal sounds like this. Let me get a sound that gives it its character going in. Now, afterwards, what I'm doing is building upon that point. Yeah. Is that where the Geico, Geico Auto Tune preset gets kicked in? Uh, I change it for each. I've, I've, I've now managed to like change it per song before it would change within songs. Mm-hmm. So I'd be changing the sound of the vocal from one verse to the next. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas now I try not to do that as much. Um, so I don't really have any any presets of any kind, to be honest. Mm. I just kind of, does this fit in with what the vibe, I think it's part of the creation of the vibe of the Absolutely. song. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. How the vocal sounds. And I think with my voice, I can do quite a lot in terms of like range, right? From mm-hmm. high to low. So it, I, I can kind of, I just kind of adjust my tone and delivery to what I think the song is, needs, and also what, and I adjust any processes on the way in mm-hmm. to in within that same process, yeah, yeah. you know. So it feels to me that with this particular track, it yeah. feels like a really fluid process. Yeah. The way, particularly the way you're talking about it, was there anything particularly challenging on along the way before it was mixed? Yeah, because it just <laughs> it's full of hiss when it came out. Like you know, it was so spontaneous. It was like you know, like miles of cable. I mean, who you knows? Been to that studio. It wasn't. It was neat enough, but it wasn't like it's. It's not a perfect space, mm-hmm. and I had because lo- I've got lots of gear, and I'll just be plugging stuff in and out. Mm-hmm. So, buzzes, hisses, so, errors. So RS RX seven was your friend. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent, and all of that. So afterwards, I had to view it as you know, the same way I would work. I was working on a film, right? I now need to go and kind of like clean this up and sort this out, and so I might to re-record this bit or. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 da. And it was just the, the real problem with this record was the the that bass line that she played just it, I needed to fix it and there was a buzz all the way through. Mm-hmm. And it, it the record didn't work without that bass line Absolutely. and she couldn't play it again. <laughs> so <laughs> so RX isotope it was then. Sit there yeah, and make and it then, happen. And then trying to like yeah. fill in the hole, like it's yeah. just it was mad to to get it to there. But I, I'm glad that I persevered with it because um, it just, it's just a record I really like. Absolutely. And it's got a really strong point in that tr- track as well. So I'm going to see if these guys have got any questions. Sure. Um, if anybody's got any questions, stick your hand up. There's a mic. Hello. Um, I just wondered, you were talking about some EQ at the beginning. You said like it saturates when yeah. you... Is that the Electrodyne you're talking about? No, it's called an inducer. I, inducer? I, yeah. The um, So the company they make, they're one of these new companies that make new analog desks oh, okay. that cost like 40 grand or whatever. Okay. But so because most people don't have 40 grand, they sell some of the modules oh, okay, out of it. Sure, sure, sure. And I just was looking and there was managed to find one that had been like massively discounted oh, and I bought sure. it and it was still like best part of 2000 quid yeah, I bought yeah. it um, and it's great so if you see one and you have the money buy Go it, for it yeah. because it's it, yeah it, it's it's a really precise and like beautiful sound of EQ but it, it does add saturation and so it's like color and control at the same time and it just it's that 70s sound yeah, yeah i've yeah, never yeah. been able to find anything that can replicate it digitally or it's like all these like color boxes and stuff like that it just blows it out of the water yeah yeah sure, and you sure, get an eq sure. with it happy days thank you very much nice one cool anybody else cool you all have memorized him am i correct Question in front here. Mm. Um, what's your favorite piece of ho- hardware and why? My favorite piece of hardware? 
That's a hard question. Um, my favorite piece of hardware, it varies. In terms of t total versatility, it's my H9000s, which I should bloody hope so, because I could have bought a car, you know. <laughs> what, what is that? It's a, it's a FX unit, it's a harmonizer. Well, the Eventide. Eventide, yeah. yeah. It's, um, well, it's the top of the range hardware one. And it just, I can use it for so many things. You can root, you can root stuff in so many incredible ways to the point where you can just press one key and you've just made a huge like pad or something. Um, you can use it to on vocals. You can just, it's just incredibly versatile and it sounds amazing. Um, but in terms of the thing that gives you the most sort of joy to the, to, to, to to use is probably um, uh, I've got a, a JR one. It's a um, it's a physical granular synth um, made by Tasty Chips. It's got a, a Raspberry Pi inside of it, and so it's a granular synth, but it's you've got tactile controls and some of the like bleeps and weird blips and stuff like that that were on that record I made you using that and it's just it just makes things that you can't make any other way but it's you're not doing it on the screen you're doing it you're doing it there so it, I mean I've never made a complete piece of music with it <laughs> but it's great for like that source that everyone's like I, I don't know it's just for like synth nerd points which matter to me, so. <laughs> and it matter to us. Cool, anyone else? I have a question actually. Yeah. Um, you said you work fast. How yeah. fast is fast? Like uh, how long was this project start to finish? Start to finish? As in like. Maybe what? without mixing, but before. Well, yeah, because the mix was, the mix was deep, bro. Yeah. We're, gonna get into, <laughs> we're gonna get into that in a minute. Well, the mix was deep, but the, um, to make that two hours and then and then probably about on the second session about another four hours so all in all from conception to actually finishing it like amber left the studio with a demo and she was there for two hours um and then afterwards i kind of finessed it a bit more the next day and spent some time tidying up that took more time. Then, then there was a gap. And I was like, look, I need live drums. And then we had to have to do another session. And we just, I just said, I think we, I just used this like second take or something. Um, but then after that, the mix was so solid. Because it was really a jammy demo -y thing that if I was to do again, I probably would just, we're going to do this all from the beginning again. But at the time, I was like, no, nah, I want to really capture them the moment of it but yeah I mean I can work yeah for me to make a song start to finish like a demo it can vary anywhere between two hours to and like a day um, but I'm not someone that I'm not someone that can that will just pump out like identical rap beats like play some blocks and just like, there you go you know I don't, I don't like that. But in terms of I, what I can do is make a song with an arrangement quicker than I, like most people. People seem to be find that uncanny. And I write lyrics really quickly. So I wrote those lyrics in about 10 minutes flat. Ooh. Thank you. Oh, is that a question there? Or yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, Super appreciate that. Um, yeah, you're very like spontaneous and very free flowing like um, um, mover in terms of your sounds. Um, like where are you like where are you at at the at the moment? Like in terms of your like your approach, like after going through that process oh, of yeah. making drift. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, as I said, it's driven me to like a, a kind of a different a fork. So I've got two projects that I'm working on now. Post that one is like a rap record. And the other one is kind of similar to this. It's kind of um, 
indie or guitars, but synthy kind of chill vibes. Um, and so I just think I often make two projects at once. So this new band is I'm working with a young artist called Paloma Leon, and she's a multi instrumentalist, and it's kind of in I guess in a similar vein to this or like Guns and those kind of songs on Drift, and then the kind of rap songs that are on Drift, I've kind of moved them more to rap, and so and it's like not even like I'm rap rapping, not even like auto tune, you know. So it's just. You know, I'm moving in divergent directions at the same time, but I feel like that's how I can stay stay sane. I don't know why, but I've always liked different kinds of music, so I just feel like well, we've got to make different kinds of music. Then I just want to make all the music, to be honest with you, and that's that's where I want to get to is where I can just people see me as a producer that can they can work with to make something interesting, and I can bring something that we can meet in a shared love of music. So like Paloma is from um, Los Angeles and then we've ended up making this kind of really LA sounding music. And then we were talking about, you know, what a visual might be like. And I said, oh, wouldn't it be, well, what the EP name would be. And I came up with the name Dogtown and she was like, I said to her, well, I don't know if I can call it that because, you know, I have a tangential relationship to, to Venice, right? And it turns out that's where I will go when I go to Los Angeles. And she was like, look, I went to school there. This is, this is exactly what this is. And to me, that's what I like to work with people is to find these kind of commonalities in our like musical knowledge um, and understanding and like life history. And, um, and that's always gonna sort of drive how I make music. Um, cause it's about, it's about sharing it. Um, and that's it really. Thank you. If you, you good or yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually like, I don't know how to operate this, but, um, <laughs> random question. You know how you answered to how long it takes you to make a tune. Do you find it easier for you to make a tune with visual or like contextual cues rather than just being in the studio and then knocking it out in two hours from just a melodic cue? No, I think, no, sometimes the visual could be distracting. The visual for me kind of helps in maybe editing, but in terms of laying it down, I just, now I've got quick because I just, I just stand on what I'm doing. So I don't, like I don't try and, like I'll play a load of stuff and then I'll just pick out the bits that are good. I don't try and replay the good bit better. And then if I, and then I'll shape it and edit it to be something and let, and let it take me and, and let it be what it's gonna be. Cause I feel like music to me, like the, the, the moments in music that have changed my life have been when I don't think I was in control. You know, by the breakthrough Mercury song that we, we had, the lyrics came to me. I just woke up in the middle of the night, walked to a computer, I was staying at my friend's house and just wrote down the first, the first verse, second verse and the chorus. Didn't really know what had happened. And then the, the next day or the, the following day, you know, like we recorded it played it to Zed Bias. He said, change the arrangement around. We put it out and then next thing you know, that was the beginning of our shit for real. So, and I had no, I, like, I wrote that verse in about five minutes. And it just, I wasn't really in control of it. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think Spectacular Anthem is the biggest song, right? Again, I went there, it didn't take too long. I just wrote the verse. Cause I feel like, with lyrics or any kind of art, what you're really trying to do is say what you want to say. Not what you, you, we all got that break. Can't say that. How will people feel if I say that? How will I look if I say that? If I really do it, what will it mean? We've all got that break. For me, it's about getting as close as you can to taking that break off. And yeah, like, I feel like 
my favorite rappers, you know, or the, the people that are seen as the greats are the ones that can really just go in there and do that, whether it's Jay-Z and Lil Wayne or Young Fraud those people. They can really just do that. Um, I'm not as good as that, but I, I see what that is. And I try and apply that to the same principle, you know, because I've, I've seen some of those guys in action and it's just it's wild. It's just turn up, it's like, are you just sitting around thinking about stuff all day then? Like, what? I do not, have you not got like cars to buy and shit? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, at the same time, I feel like it's important to be precise and like, I'm quite technical sort of after the fact. I've got it now, like, let me place this in the right way. Let me think about things. And it's not just like slapdash, but in the moment, yeah, I'm just trying to like let, let go basically. Cool, thank you um, for your questions. Um, just gonna circle back a little bit because you said this was a deep one and we like deep ones. So the mixing process. <laughs> yeah, I think if you, in the past I'd always made music in a, a bit more of a controlled situation um, and I'd grown to kind of, I didn't like it um, and so I wanted to do something different. But if you're basically doing it in like a sort of like one rung above DIY, like like DIY, but like you got an advance, so you just went crazy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it, you know, I look at it this way, like I'm quite into cars and stuff. You, you know, when someone's like got a build and they're not quite sure what they're doing and then it comes out, it looks kind of good, but it's, something's not quite right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of how this was with this particular record. It was like, okay, this is a vibe and it sounds good, but it's also just like a bit of a mess. So I need to fix it. Um, and so that that became, you've got two bass lines and things like that. It's like quite finding space yeah. for for everything. You know, when I when I sort of like mixed the EQ, the the, the, the melodic bass higher, it kind of lost the vibe, mm -hmm. but there was no, not much low end to it anyway. So I had to put the sub in, but then you're getting masking issues, then the drums and just trying to like find a way that you, I could side chain everything. And what I do as well is I use side chain in a creative way. I use side chain on a lot of my sort of mid range textures. Okay. So I'll record loads of pads and then side chain them um, like off each other and then turn that whole thing into one, like try and smush it. So they're all kind one, of pushing and pulling yeah, independently. Yeah, kind of one yeah. one evolving, mm. evolving thing mm. um, to try and it's kind of make, it's like an ambient thing and, and use uh, uh, the makeup game um, creatively mm -hmm. and I'll automate stuff like that. So that it's just fundamentally like taking some techniques from I've got from making film scores and making ambient music mm -hmm. to create, use pads in a way that you might use a chord progression, mm -hmm. but it's not so much, it's just quite fluid. And really, I guess, really leaning into the modulation, you know, yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you mix the track, the album yourself? Most of it, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it must have been a nightmare. Um, well, this track's the only one that was that, Militant. Okay, because it was just made off the cuff. Yeah, but, but did you have to have a different mindset when you're actually mixing the record? Because you know, on one hand, the compositional aspect and obviously bringing the mm. tracks to life was quite. It was what it was. It was kind of like very yeah. organic process. But mixing is quite structured, isn't it? Right? Do you know what I mean? So how do you, how did you maintain the fluidity of the compositional process, mm. but also having to be quite mindful of the fact that each track needs to have consistency when it comes to mixing. And yeah. Stuff, you know? So it was like, because I kind of, the creative part of the mixing, I kind of do as I go along, like yeah. the sound of it. Mm -hmm. And then it's, was, it's more about stereo image and about just general weight and stuff like that. Yeah. And so I do just listen to all the songs next to each other. Mm -hmm. And I put, I put them, actually put them end to end mm -hmm. and I'd make notes. I'd, I'd go and I'd listen to it as one thing, and I'd make notes. This needs, more, this needs to happen more here. This needs more of this. This needs more of this. And so it was this kind of thing of staying in the studio, doing that, walking home, listening to it, writing down the thing, coming back and doing it, and viewing it as if I was 
doing like a, a score project. So just to circle back on that, so you're mixing each track independently and yeah. listening to the to the demo mix in the context of the whole mix. Yeah. Right, so you then you're going, oh, that's interesting. So rather yeah. than like finishing them off and then doing the order later, you know what the order is. And yeah. then you're tweaking the mix as, as you go. Okay. So it's the idea behind yeah. this idea of drift is you put it on and you just listen to it. Yeah. So from the beginning, it was like, as soon as I got, like I didn't do more demos than the song. Maybe one song didn't make it. For the most part, from very early on, it was one whole thing. And then I thought, well, okay, it's all going to go through the same set of stuff. And so my theory was that it should, if I kind of think of it as one thing and I use that and I kind of do it all together, mm -hmm. then it will become, it will be, it will be consistent and I can generate a consistent sound. And I did. Um, it wasn't, it was, it's kind of mixing isn't quite the word. It was more like, Balancing, maybe balancing, or, balance, or just yeah. yeah. It's like it's like you're making. It's like a sculpture. Mm. That's how I viewed it. Like you're sort of sculpting the 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 the, the, the sound because I, I I envisage it as this what this thing that you would just put on and you'd listen to in whatever player I'd created. So I wouldn't really think about anything to do with it needs to sound good on Spotify or it needs to. I just wanted it to make sense together. And so it was. It was really fun, and it, it it lent itself to like little bits of extra production, and little bits of detail. Mm -hmm. or I might be like, oh, let me get the guitars from this one bit and resample that, and then put that in this. And so actually, it all kind of makes sense. And mm -hmm. like, I've got um, I used a twenty six hundred in the mixing stage to add mm -hmm. the kind of like spacey, VP yep. bit bits. Mm -hmm. um, um, just to that's the arp, right? Huh? The, the arp, yeah. yeah. Mm. To, to to add those things um, after the fact, because they're kind of like almost like a stylistic glue. Mm -hmm. So it, it it was it was the mixing and sort of extra composition were hand in hand, mm -hmm. and so I was trying to develop a like sort of a coherent sound. I think what's funny about that is, in terms of how people took the album, that's definitely been something that people were like, okay, yeah, this is we we, we it's interesting what he's done with production. But I think in I was so focused on doing that that I didn't I, I just kind of didn't really consider that my kind of like live vocalness to it for some people who were quite used to a very computery sort of vocal from me would they would be alienated. They'd be like well, I don't understand, this doesn't sound like Drake or whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> What's he doing? Yeah. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't sound like Drake, Drake personally. So. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, um, but for me, you know, I, I, you know, it was, um, yeah, I loved it. It wasn't, it wasn't too stressful. This record was just particularly. I got difficult. you. Understood. Um, let me see if we've got a couple more time for a couple of questions. Yeah, question at the back. There you go. About the mixing, I was just going to ask, what's your monitoring setup? Uh, I've got the Adam. I don't know which ones they are. They, I've got some nice Adams that cost me a bit of money. Um, and right now, yeah, I'm using the ones that theme. Oh, I can't remember. They're the ones with the titanium cone. They really. I basically I like really stiff monitors. So, so either the studio I'm working out of now or the ones that I own. I like really precise stiff monitors. I don't think, like, if I go in a session with someone who's like, "Oh man, like, I just, I just want to, I just want to catch a vibe or whatever," I like, I start moonwalking out the door because it's like, come on, man, you know, I, I like really precise, transparent monitors because for as much as it's balanced to all, it, you know, if you're doing this much like floating about, there needs to be something that will let you know, nah, nah this can't work. So. Um, they're A7s, I think, the Adams I've got. A77s, I don't know what A77 is. Um, Do I have room, room treatment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, this was recorded in a, a vault in Truman Brewery. In a, so, yeah, the room is fully treated. And um, where I'm recording now, it's fully treated. So, like, everything sonically is deliberate, right? Because that's what I like to have transparent monitors in a treated room. I don't like to mix in headphones. 
I don't like to mix in a hotel room. I don't like to, I don't even really like to compose in those places. Um, I quite like to be in a space that is designed to make music. It, more than anything, it's a concentration thing. Um, and also, it's a historically, I've, I never, I've never, maybe the first, like, Murkish records we made in like home studios, but pretty quickly, I was not, you know, I was not in my bedroom. So, I, I, I just I, like I struggle to do it. I mean, uh, what I will do is sometimes I will compose at my house and or check a mix on my speakers, but that's really a particular kind of like if I've if I've got paid to do something I don't care about if I'm being honest with you <laughs> and I'm like I'm not going to the studio today and this is some commercial thing and I'm just like bam 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 I'll do it and then and then I'll go in the studio and mix it. But yeah. I like to I like a treated space for sure. Thank you for your question. Um a couple of questions from me. Well I've said loads of questions actually. Yeah. So first one is um yeah if our audience or producers out there um, were wanting to delve into the world of hardware, yeah. but have got you know reasonably sized pockets. Um, what uh, hardware would you recommend people get to grips with? And mm, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm going to say get a Korg Minilog because actually there's a lot of things you can do with it, and you will understand synthesis. If you want to get a good sound out of it, you need to learn. And it's just, but it's it looks nice. I'm not, I don't like super small plastic synths. Um, so I think the Cool Minilog for me is a great, a great synth to buy because I think it sounds good and I think you can make anything with it. And you, you've got a small amount of controls, but actually, there's lots there's lots of things you can do with it, and I think I think they sound great. I think. Um, Old, old school drum machines, all the old like boss drum machines and, and just old drum machines um, are great because they've got so much stuff on them and so many cool sounds that I think always sound a bit, bit, bit better than than um, software drums. Um, I don't know why that is, but I think they do. I also think um, I've got an MPC Live and it's a kind of, you know, from like 2014 or whatever it is. But I think it's great. I think it's sort of America. It's like bait American muscle. It's bait, but great. It's like if you, you know, you want all that, damn son, where'd you find that? Like all that. It's like, you know what I mean? There's no other way of doing that. And I feel like, yeah, I just think, I've been lucky enough to like make music in Atlanta with people and it's that's what they use and they program everything on there it's just there's, there's big hits you know as are made the, the, by those things and I think there's just a certain as a, it's a sample s sampler and as they go I don't know the buttons are really thick so I would say I was going to start out now and I was going to get hardware I would get uh, it pretty much describes my sound. I'd get a mini lock <laughs> and an MPC live. Mm -hmm. And um, what about on the hardware? The kind of um, on you know, would you prioritize an EQ over a compressor? You know, if you wanted to go that, the, you know, the kind of oh yeah, you know, character texture building. Yeah, an EQ. I, I think compressors. I don't see a massive difference between software and hardware compressors. I think. That's one thing that AI is good at doing. Um, I think I wouldn't like. I don't know. It's the, when you're when you're recording instruments on the way in, I think hardware compressors are great. But I don't. I like. I there was a there was a remember a few years ago there was this trend of everyone buying incredibly expensive, tubey things for their like weird eighties music that no one cared about. And I think um, I just think it's. Some of those things are now back on the market and you can probably buy them. But um, for me, it's instruments. At, certainly at the beginning, right? It's because it's, it's you can always 
take your place somewhere to get mi- you know mixing is a specialist thing i chose to do it on this record because i wanted a particular character and it was part of the way i was doing but i don't always mix my own records and i think what i believe in is hardware instruments you know the weirder the better you know because I, it always astounds me when I go to music studios and there's no instruments. I just, I don't understand. Like, it doesn't make sense in my head. It's like, are we, is this an office? <laughs> um, so yeah, like, and yeah, old school instruments. Like I, all across Jeff, there's, um, I, I bought a, um, a djembe and I just like watched a bit of YouTube, taught myself to play it and then just played it in. And you just, there's no way of, um, you can't fake that. Cool. Um, so you talked, alluded to it earlier. So you're working on these couple of projects. Um, what's next for men like Geico? <sighs> Who knows? All sorts of things. Um, I'm going to put out this new music. Um, I've got this this rap release that I'm kind of connected to. Some visual, like I say visual, but more like sculptural slash engineering work I'm doing. Um, and I, I'm kind of gonna put out some product and some concept work with this music. Mm-hmm. And then the, the indie side, the kind of rock side, I don't know. I mean, I think we're gonna make a film. Um, for people that don't know, my brother's a film director and I work with him quite a lot. And so we're looking to set up a production business um and maybe we'll do some stuff with this music just because it's quite cinematic music and um yeah i want to do events and just kind of push things push the underground i think for me after you know a 10-year adventure in in labels and all of that stuff i've kind of come full circle where i'm like what matters is where I came from, which is, I, I don't think I ever really left, um, but I'm just sort of really full fright on it. You know, like I, you know, my first headline show was right here in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And uh, that's amazing. You know what I mean? I, don't, I, don't, I think t- to be totally honest, if, you know, I came into this thing as a rapper, right? And if the pinnacle of rap music is to be Drake, then I think I know which direction I'm going. <laughs> it's just pretty logical. So <laughs> yeah, the, the future is like trying to trying to continue what I'm doing, which is, you know, champion new music, create new music, try and find new new forms of expression, you know, based on who I am and where I come from and, 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 and what I believe in. Um, and just, yeah, keep making music. Like, I'll never stop, so. Cool. Gaika, thank you very much for your time, man. Give it up, people. Thank you.